I know why you guys got the crayons. You're going to take notes. <laughs> so prior to calling me to this pulpit, this congregation selected from itself a group of lay leaders who were tasked with the ministerial search process. They are still recovering to this day. <laughs> I looked over at Pat and she's like, oh. <laughs> We're doing it again. And part of that, part of that process <clears throat> was to gain some understanding of the congregation's past and to find some way to characterize as best as possible and in several different ways and uh, with several different methods what the character of this congregation is or was at that time. One of the strongest impressions that was conveyed in the packet that they put together for us prospective ministers in search to read was that this church was a teenager. It was, that was a very helpful cat, uh, characterization. I suppose the idea was that there had been a birth and an infancy and a youthful period of development, but it was thought that this congregation seemed ready and even eager to take the next step. And this was two or three years ago that this information was being gathered and, and conveyed. So having outgrown our old clothes, no longer identifying ourselves by our parentage, but not yet knowing what our new identity was or is. This is what it's like to be a teenager, right? And much like teenagers, we were or are in a significant period of transition, of introspection, of figuring out who we are, who we were, and who we want to be. So I remember reading that idea in the search packet and laughing and looking over at Katie and for whatever reason I remember this happening in a car at night and Katie was driving. I was reading the search packet on the computer and I looked over at Katie and I, and I laughed. I said, they said that they're teenagers. <laughs> you know what that means? That means that there is some self-destruction in their future. <laughs> Now, I knew that for two reasons. One, I have seen teenagers. <laughs> two, I have been a teenager. Actually, I want to broaden the category from teenager to adolescent. And these days, the adolescent is anywhere from 13 to 35, <laughs> which I took full advantage of. Anyway, at some point in that age range, there is and really should be at least one self-destruction. Why? Well, it's a rite of passage in a culture that has divested itself or diluted all institutional rites of passage. Self-destruction is a rite of passage. And like all rites of passage, I suppose that self-destruction has something to do with coming into an authentic sense of self. To come into an authentic sense of self, the old self must be burned down. There is a trick, and that trick is to select the right method of demolition. <laughs> because this is a dangerous and glorious time. It can be fatal. But to do nothing is to risk a life without meaning, without growing, without power. To do nothing is to risk a life without honor, which is a life without becoming responsible for your own actions. And so it's risky either way. And self-destruction 
can be so much fun. <laughs> and also enriching, and it can yield honor and strength and conviction and meaning. So it's a rite of passage. It is and will be for Mountain Vista Unitarian Universalist Congregation. It probably was or has been for most of you. And personally, it certainly was for me. I self-destructed more than once. And sometimes I did it well. And sometimes I did not do it well. Most of my life, I'd been a, a pretty good kid. In high school, I was, in the parlance of the times, a goody-goody. Though not, in the parlance of a prior time, a square. <laughs> Although maybe I was. I had a nice, you know, trim haircut and my eyes were ever clear. Uh, I checked in with my parents all the time. Uh, that was good. Those were good things, by the way. I was a jock. Uh, I was a swimmer. I was on student council, drama club, a good student, all that, all that. And shortly after leaving home, though, that picture changed. I shaved my head. And this was at a time, I mean, this is 1990, right? So this is at a time, um, I mean, Eugene, you could shave your head and it's okay today, right? But back in 1990, you shave your head, you're making a statement, and maybe it's not a very loving statement. Uh, at that time, skinheads were the only people that shaved their head, and they were in the business of hate. Well, I was in the business of contrariness and confusion. So I shaved my head as a challenge to that stereotype. Um, I started experimenting with uh, life. And <laughs> after swimming collegiately for a season, I quit. Uh, I transferred schools, which is kind of like transferring dreams. I traveled in many countries in a couple different dimensions. I lost some time and I lost some traction. I gained some perspective and some debt. I made mistakes and I made memories. I made a life and I made friends. From nothing I grew my hair long and grew a wispy beard. I established piercings and then I shaved my hair and all my long hair except a strip down the middle, a mohawk, and I joined a band <laughs> and invited my parents to hear us. <laughs> they lived in Sierra Vista at the time. I was in Tempe. They didn't have to move very far to hear us. <laughs> they did not know what they were hearing but they heard us. And, I, you know, that last bit is important, you see. I wasn't angry. I was not angry. I didn't hate my old self or where I'd come from. And I know some of you may have had a more infuriating experience growing up that caused your self-destruction to be one of anger. And, and that's okay. You had good reason. Mine was more of a benevolent rebellion, a benevolent self-destruction. And I invited my benevolent past to witness it all the while. And in fact, I invited them to play a part and even subsidize the revolution, so to speak. <laughs> Thank you, mom and dad. And I mention that because I think it's the same for whatever self-destruction MVUU shall engage in as well, this teenage congregation. A benevolent self-destruction in deep relationship with our beloved past and our hoped for future. At any rate, what is important to note is that I both remade and remained myself. I destroyed my given self to find my true self and found, in fact, that the core of each was the same. but it would not have done to let the core continue in the old 
shell. The old shell of myself had served its purpose, but was not fit for the growth that my core demanded and, and, and was not of my own making. And so I couldn't own it as me. So it had to go. I had to burn it down. I had to die a little bit many different times. And, and from there, I had to recreate a resurrection, as it were. And here it is, Easter and the time of Passover. And here it is, Flower Communion. And here it is, the day we vote on the direction we will orient ourselves to on the day that we discover our intention. Passover and Easter are both about life after death. They're, they're both about life after destruction. Destruction of an identity. Passover celebrates a new identity, that of freed slaves. It celebrates surviving the death of enslavement and the Armageddon of one deadly night. It celebrates a communal salvation which if you've been coming, you know that I like to think of salvation as a freedom from fear. So this is a communal freedom from fear. Easter also celebrates new life, the life of Jesus, as I want to read it, is a new teaching in an old form. And in that reading, the death of Jesus is the destruction of the old form. The empty tomb is the new identity of a formlessness, of possibility, of freedom and immediacy. You are responsible for filling the empty tomb. And this was a new kind of freedom, more spiritual than physical, more personal than communal, more about a way of being than about uh, your political, physical situation. So it celebrates less of a communal salvation and more of a personal salvation. And it holds out the opportunity that we may each, by our experience and imagination, find a way to live without fear. And of course, each of these overlays a basic idea that we have humans have known since before we had words to know it with. And that idea is that life renews. Life is revision. Death of the old creates new life and new life feeds all life. So as we celebrate spring, as we celebrate Passover, as we celebrate community and its perpetuation, as we celebrate communal and personal freedom, as we celebrate Easter, as we celebrate resurrection and a new way of being, we also celebrate flower communion, a ritual that harkens back to our heritage, even as it declares us a new thing. A community of beautiful, bright, disseminating individuals that come together to share ourselves and then dissipate. But dissipate with something new that we carry into the world. And here too, before me, in these flowers, is a little death. The flower that you will receive is dying. But in this death, much like the death of Jesus, an idea is born. This sacrifice, the sacrifice of the flowers, gives new life in its message of community, beauty, history, and evolution. And not only are flowers, but today's vote is a little death. It is. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. It's OK. No matter what we are deciding, we are deciding to destroy something that we are. And I know that can be a little scary. I know that can be a little sad. 
a little uncertain. But there is no life without movement. There is no religious liberal institution without revision. There's no life without change, and that means no life without a little self-destruction. And so if today's vote is a little death, it is also a cornucopia of life. It is an act of hope. It is a step into freedom and responsibility and authenticity. It is an invitation to a new identity. It's just the invitation. It's not the identity. It's the invitation to a new identity. And if that bothers you or scares you, just remember your own forays into self-destruction. They may have been long and winding, but here you are. And if that is too painful, remember mine. And know, know in your bones, know in the smiles and handshakes and hugs and tears and laughter and love that is all around you right now. Know that we will remake ourselves even as we remain ourselves. And so, by the power invested in us all, by us all, and by the ever-churning web of mutual arising, and by all that was and is and will be, I bless these flowers before me. I let them back to you now as a reminder of the new life and the sustaining power and the remaking and resurrecting power of the universe. If I could have children come to the front and distribute these flowers to all the adults and everybody in the room will have musical accompaniment to cover your tracks. If I could have the children come. Come on up. <laughs> <laughs>